our next speaker, Patria Noble. And uh, Patria is a senior paintings conservator and the head of paintings conservation at the Rijksmuseum. Since heading the studio in 2014, Patria has expanded the department, laying the emphasis for, or increasing the emphasis on scientific research. Thank you, Patria. And between 1996 and 2014, she was a paintings conservator at the Moritz House Museum in The Hague, and since 2005, the head of conservation. As an expert in the materials aspects and conservation of 17th century Dutch paintings, she has lectured and published widely. And uh, she has, from 2012 to 2018, participated in the Science for Arts Initiative, revisualizing Rembrandt, the development and application of new imaging techniques, co-funded by the Netherlands Organization for Scientific Research, the NWO, and the National Science Foundation, the NSF, on the application of new imaging techniques for the investigation of late Rembrandt paintings, which has produced some magnificent results. So please join me in welcoming Patria for the conservation challenges posed by metal soaps. So uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you very much to Peter and to Jennifer for inviting me to be here. It's um, it's a great uh, pleasure and privilege to speak. So um, let's see Thanks. how this works. No, that's the pointer. Um, which one is it? This one. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> so I'm going to also um, I'm going to start off with this quote um, from Yoon Herman's recent PhD thesis, and I um, this has been mentioned before on metal soaps. Um, from a chemical point of view, oil paintings are not stable objects. Visually, changes in the appearance of an oil painting might be slow, but over the course of decades or even centuries, chemical reactions and physical processes do affect the color, texture, or integrity of the oil paint layers. So in this presentation, I'm going to draw on past research and pioneering studies of metal soap-related degradation in oil paintings, primarily from the collection of the Maratzos uh, Museum in The Hague, where I was working at the time. Scientific analysis were carried out as part of the Mollard and the Mayana research project sponsored by the Netherlands Organization for Scientific Research, spearheaded by Professor Dr. Jaap Bohm, um, that was situated at the Fom Amof Institute. So... Um, here we're going to see some pictures again of Rembrandt's anatomy lesson of Dr. Nicholas Tulp in the Morris House, because um, this was one of the first paintings in which lead soap degradation was identified. And it was during the examination and treatment of the painting in 1996-98 um, that uh, this took place. Um, so here we see the painting in total, and here we see a detail um, uh, the, the surface of the painting was found to be riddled with these microscopic round holes that are approximately 200 microns in diameter. Uh, many of the holes had slightly raised edges and contained lumps of whitish material. This is a detail from the flesh tone. Um, in terms of uh, visual impact on the painting, this resulted in a diminished gloss and a dull, hazy, gritty, sandy type uh, surface. Um, but we were also concerned that it could negatively influence the cleaning of the painting and could eventually undermine the picture's stability. So uh, uh, we undertook a, a scientific study. It was very opportune at this moment that the Mollart uh, research project had just started. Um, so um, the analysis that uh, followed, and here we see my um, uh, sample form on the left that I filled out, I think in 1996, so that is like more than 20 years ago. And, uh, and the cross section, one of the cross sections that I took here on the right. And this is a cross section of an intact protrusion where you see, um, you know, the lead soap mass um, protruding out of the, uh, the upper ground layer. Um, so the cross sections will reveal this strongly fluorescent translucent aggregate mass uh, that was found to originate in the upper lead white gray ground. And in this cross section, it's clear to see that the lumps are pushed up through the surface paint, uh, which accounts for the paint losses observed on the paint surface. The backscatter image that we see at the lower right 
um, shows remineralization bands of newly formed lead compounds. And they were then, um, that was all analyzed with XRD. I don't have the, um, the exact, uh, I remember lead carbonate was one of the compounds formed. And I think it's the remineralization uh, compounds that are formed that actually accounts for these differences in opacity uh, and translucency that one sees, because it's actually the local chemistry the available of the available materials that actually determines the appearance of the particular uh, uh, aggregates uh, from painting to painting. Um, so um, the lumps uh, were identified as um, lead carboxylates, uh, commonly referred to as lead soaps, um, and uh, as a result of chemical change in the paint. In 2002, we coined the term protrusions to describe this phenomenon, um, which is still the most common term used today by conservators to denote metal soap aggregates that actually break through the surface of the paint, causing paint loss or texture changes. So the anatomy lesson was not the only example. We went on to investigate many other paintings in the collection of the Marasos that exhibited the same phenomenon. The results of an international survey carried out in 2002 brought to light thousands of paintings with lead soap degradation, um, paintings from all geographical regions and dates on all sorts of supports and including both treated and untreated paintings. Uh, paints containing lead white, lead tin yellow type 1, red lead, lead dryers and dark poorly coordinated oil rich paint were reported. A consistent feature was exposure to high relative humidity in the uh, environment or the history of the painting, either from display, storage conditions or treatment. And it was now clear that thousands of paintings in other collections around the world demonstrated uh, these kind of phenomena. So um, numerous examples of zinc soap related degradation in 19th and 20th century paintings were also reported. Um, i just show a couple here, including many works by Vincent van Gogh and Mondrian, where the extrusion and eruption of the highly mobile zinc soap severely embrittled and compromised the paint. Um, texture alterations were also noted, and in this 19th century painting, the lead soap aggregates have resulted in this very lumpy texture that was not intended by the artist, but interestingly, in the um, uh, notes in the museum about this painting, it was referred to as a textured ground. So, um, um, and this is very similar to the kind of lumpy surface that uh, Sylvia showed in the Sargent painting. Um, probably one of the most important and interesting examples in this regard is Vermeer's view of Delft in the Maritzhaus, where for years it was thought that the tiny lumps visible in the rooftops in the painting were intentional. Um, this was um, an observation made in 1994 when the painting was treated in the Maratos, but this was purely based on visual inspection. At the time, there was no uh, analysis carried out. Um, and as a result, for a long time, it's been thought that Vermeer added sand to his paint for a deliberate textural effect. This even made the headlines in the Dutch newspapers in 1994 when the painting was treated and has thereafter appeared in much art historical literature on Vermeer. And this is a, a citation from, uh, from Martin Bailey. Um, so the meticulous way that Rembrandt worked on this masterpiece, that Vermeer worked on this masterpiece is shown by the fact that he mixed grains of sand into some of his paint to achieve a certain texture. And of course, over time, these quotes get repeated in various museum publications, you know. Um, so often the curators are very surprised to find out that that's not true. Um, and of course, uh, we went on to show that this was clearly not the case. Um, but in fact, those protruding lumps are, are lead soap aggregates. Um, so uh, investigation of several other paintings in the Maritzhaus also led to important discoveries regarding the relationship uh, of metal soaps and increased transparency. In this painting by Roland Savare's Orpheus in Chaining the Animals with his music, the saponification of the lead white particles has caused the brown foreground paint to darken. And as a result, the light dark contrasts in the painting are distorted and many of the small animals uh, are now very difficult to concern. Um, the loss of opacity of lead white due to saponification can have an enormous visual impact on the appearance of paintings, and I'm sure nearly everyone has seen examples like this uh, Adrian Quarter painting. 
Um, we went on to show that increased transparency can also manifest itself in many ways, depending on the physical structure of the support. Um, this is a painting by Art van der Neer, River Landscape. And this is an example of selective darkening associated with the chalk field deep channels of the early wood of the oak panel. So due to the saponification and loss of the opacity of the lead white particles in the pinkish priming, um, a color shift has taken place from pinkish brown to brown in this painting. And the darkening of the oil soaked chalk ground below the priming has also contributed to the effect. And if we zoom in uh, further, it's clear to see that these dark streaks in the sky are not the uh, wood grain, but in fact, it's the darkened streaks of the underlying priming. Um, and the expansion of that layer has actually caused the sky paint to actually flake off. And you can actually see this uh, in this, yeah, here. So here, the, the sky paint is actually flaked off. And here on the left side, you can see the some of the surface paint is more intact. And I think that becomes clear if we look at the backscatter images uh, of the paint cross sections um, from a sample from a intact um, area of the sky and on the right side from one of the streaks in the sky. And if you look at this, these are the same scale bar, but you can see that there's a complete difference in the uh, condition of the lead white particles in these two samples. And this was a work that was published in 2008 as part of a conference. Um, I've got the reference at the bottom. So um, this actual uh, type of uh, selected darkening occurs actually quite frequently in Van Goyen's panel paintings. I imagine that every collection around the world would have examples of Van Goyen paintings with these kind of problems. Um, and I think that here's a detail of the sky. Um, and here too, um, these kind of lines have been often erroneously interpreted as a deliberate part of the pictorial design. Um, and um, it's, um, and I think it's quite easy to see why um, that uh, that these um, lines and losses actually um, appear to mimic the sort of the structure of the wood grain. Um, and I think also this phenomena is actually frequently, uh, the reason why it's frequently observed in Dutch panel paintings is also linked to the course of the use of coarse grained oak panels and also the combination of the chalk ground at a lead white rich priming layer in combination with an economical painting technique. And I think it's interesting that um, Henry Fielding uh, in the 19th century made remarks about the visibility of the wood grain and the destruction and, and the um, compromised condition of paintings by Van Goya. And so uh, this sort of suggests that to some extent this might have already been known in the 19th century. So um, here we have another example. So while I was uh, treating this painting in 2005, um, we identified uh, yet another form of metal soap related degradation, uh, lead rich. Um, uh, soap or salt deposits, the form on the paint surface. Um, and before treatment, this insoluble whitish haze could be discerned with the naked eye in the, um, here in the curtain, um, in the upper right part of the painting. Um, and it was only with a hundred times magnification with a digital microscope that the, actually the white crystals associated with this haze could be resolved. Now, in the end, with this painting, we decided not to attempt to remove it. We could actually see with the cross sections and the back scattered uh, images that actually uh, that some of the deposits were actually quite intimately bound with the paint surface. So then, you know, it was clear that we, you would be at risk at trying to remove it. Um, So over the course of the last 10 years, um, due to all the advanced analysis and research that's taken place, we have also come to understand that these chemical processes continue. Um, and there are examples, uh, and here again I show um, an image from the anatomy lesson where the lead soap aggregates have continued um, to, uh, yeah, to grow. In this case, they're broken through um, later additions um, in the painting. And I'm referring to um, these small numbers there are, uh, that are placed above the head of each of the figures in the painting. 
and um, the lead soap aggregates have actually broken through this paint layer, which was actually applied in the 18th century. Um, and uh, this is another example um, by in a painting by Nicholas Berkham. Um, that was discovered that these extensive pinpoint losses are a result of the aggregates originating from the beige lead white containing ground and here they've erupted through this brighter red modern overpaint um, indicating that the process oh, I'll go back indicating that the process is still ongoing um, and here's another example where whitish deposits um, uh, formed on the surface of Garrett Dow's young mother in this case, over a period of just a few months, uh, between March and July 2007, when the painting was hanging on a, in a microclimate frame on the southwest wall of the early Rembrandt Gallery in the Maritz House. And deposits uh, also formed on the inside of the glass, which were identified as sodium soaps, um, palmitate and sterate, if I recall, um, indicating an origin from the oil binding medium of the paint. Um, and the sodium is considered to have originated from the glass. So subsequent monitoring was carried out um, by the Technical University of Eindhoven um, of the climate conditions in the wall behind the painting. And this demonstrated daily temperature fluctuations in the period of, I think this was in the summer, in, uh, in July, uh, between 15 and 30 degrees. Um, in contrast to the normal temperature in the middle of the gallery recorded by the sensor of 20 degrees. Um, so this was really quite shocking. Um, as a result, we published this as a poster in AIC in 2010. Um, but as a result of this case study, the Maritzos took measures to improve the insulation of the walls during the renovation of the museum in 2012. And here in the next image, um, we see um, the inside of the glass of the climate frame. Um, um, and between 2001 and 2007, whitish deposits on the glass of more than 200 paintings had been removed. And um, the formation of these deposits and fatty acids, um, I think, have been observed in, in many museums you know, around the world. Um, and there's always been a lot of discussion what is actually the nature of those deposits. In this case, it was analyzed so we know what they were. Um, and now I'll talk a little bit about uh, the conservation challenges. I think you probably have a sense of that already. Um, I mean, given, especially given the enormous variation uh, in the manifestations. Uh, so, you know, the challenges actually are really enormous at the moment. Um, I, think, um, I think especially for modern paintings, I mean, um, modern, I think they really present the greatest challenges of all. Um, and I've got two examples, two Mondrian paintings here uh, at the left. Um, I'm not going to go into that now, but you can read the Metal Soaps book where there's numerous chapters developed <laughs> to this subject. Um, but also for all master paintings, for, for instance, this Van Goya painting uh, in the collection of the Maritos, uh, whose sky is actually filled with those darkened streaks like I showed you from the Art Van Denier painting. I mean, just how much uh, retouching is acceptable and um, in this particular case, uh, the curators decided to take it off show. So it's, this is a picture that's never on display. Um, so um, metal soap, I think also uh, dealing with metal soap, uh, efflorescent hazes and crafts are some of the visually most disturbing and challenging for a conservator. Um, these can sometimes be thinned or removed with an aqueous gel, but this will depend on the nature of the surface deposits and the degree to which they have actually become imbibed in the paint surface, as well as the sensitivity of the underlying paint. So great caution has to be exercised in the choice and use of cleaning agents. Um, in the case of the Pellegrini ceiling paintings in the Maritos, that was possible. The Actually, the examination of the cross sections and the backscatter images actually showed that the, in this case, the, um, the dark um, surface deposits were um, quite superficial. So here you see this is a tr an image during treatment. This is the cleaned area of the painting. And this is actually what it looked like after the natural resin varnish had been removed. So, um, and this is the painting on the right after cleaning. And um, so this is again, um, the appearance of these hazes. In this case, the haze appears dark because of soot 
from a coal stove that used to be in the middle of the galleries for, you know, for a long period of time. Um, and uh, so in order to carry out this cleaning uh, that was only done after much rigorous testing using a specially developed gel testing protocol that you can also read about in the Metal Soaps book. <laughs> um, I think for a painting like this, Rembrandt's Homer from 1663, which is a, which a picture I worked on in 2006, unfortunately the crust um, was very intimately bound with the paint. Um, and therefore it was not possible to, uh, to remove this without physical damage to the painting. And there was actually one area of the painting where you could see that attempts had been made in the past to do that. So essentially there was an area of about 20 centimeters wide where the whole surface had been skimmed, I think. Um, so, um, Um, I'm going to show now a couple of examples about the recent treatment of uh, Rembrandt's uh, portraits of uh, Martin Sulman's and Opium Coppet that we recently completed uh, between 2016 and 2018 that also presented a number of challenges. Um, the, um, we show here, we see the paintings before treatment. Um, and just, I'll just quickly show, this is a very nice detail, you know, before and after cleaning, removing the varnishes that were apl applied in the 1950s. But actually, um, uh, after removal of the natural resin varnishes, we were confronted with um, uh, the remains of an old egg white varnish. And here we see a detail of the egg white varnish in the cloak of Martin. Um, and of course, an egg white varnish is not soluble in organic solvents, which is actually, you have to use an aqueous gel. Um, so it's, uh, I think I've got, um, of course, cross sections actually showed, uh, the presence of, so here in this image, we see, um, the background paint, and then that is, um, uh, Rembrandt's black paint. You can see actually how thin that is. And then this whole packet here are the varnish layers. Um, you can also see the cupping of the paint that we believe is actually a result of the, um, the egg white varnish uh, on the on the paint layer. Um, so here we see the backscatter image of this particular cross section. Um, and what we found was actually occurring was that here in the um, the thick egg white varnish, you also had these lead rich degradation products. Now this had implications for the removal of the egg white varnish because um, it was. Uh, as we know, um, you have a, um, let's see, um, a, a migration of the lead ions from the lead rich uh, ground um, into this um, hygroscopic um, egg white layer. So, this was actually a very challenging aspect of the treatment. Um, in our discussion with our director at the time, uh, you know, uh, we were asked, well, what is the risk of leaving the egg white varnish on the painting? Um, and I think uh, this is where it became really um, apparent that um, a risk analysis tool um, is actually really important for uh, complex restorations. Um, so, I mean, in thinking a little bit more about it uh, for this presentation, um, and, you know, I think... Um, having a tool that would be customized for the cleaning of painting would um, provide a decision-making method and help ad identify a lot of the scientific challenges and help clarify issues of importance and also help define um, some budget priorities. Um, so, um, let me see where I'm up to. Oh yeah, here. So several risk management models exist for the heritage sector, including an international standard developed in 2016 by ICROM and CCI. Uh, this figure shows, for instance, the main steps defined by the standard as well as concepts and tools developed uh, for uh, the heritage sector. Um, if we look at the step identify, unfortunately the precision with which this could be customized at the moment for the cleaning of paintings is currently limited by a lack of knowledge about the role of solvents and moisture in triggering chemical uh, processes in the paint, uh, as uh, discussed by Sylvia. 
and points to need for more fundamental analysis on this topic. I think a risk management approach would also uh, force us to think where identified materials are in their lifetimes and to inquire into treatment history and the nature of events and climate conditions in the lifetime of the objects. And for instance, if we look at the history of display of Rembrandt's anatomy lesson that I showed you in the beginning of the talk, it's interesting to note that the painting hangs on the same southwest wall in the early Rembrandt gallery of the Maritzhaus. So the temperature gradients of the resulting moisture transport that would have occurred in the painting over a long period of time, in addition to Rembrandt's materials, go a long way in explaining why this picture and many others in the collection are so affected by metal soap degradation. Moreover, the galleries were heated for a long time with coal stoves. Uh, we see an image of one of those uh, in, in the middle. And the picture has also undergone more than 20 treatments in its lifetime, including solvents, moisture and heat, and including five linings. Um, so in conclusion, um, I'd like to propose a scientifically based risk management approach to be customized for the treatment of paintings. Um, I think there should be more emphasis on prevention, since we now know that humidity influences the rate of hydrolysis of the drying oil, whereby more fatty acids, free fatty acids, are released and become available to react with metal ions at the paint layers. Moreover, it's now known that moisture drives the mobility of fatty acids and that water plays a crucial role in the saponification of the metal ions and the fatty acids. Um, I also fully support a science-based conservation treatment and the need for advancing the role of humanities in conservation, especially the need to look at the biography of objects, the treatment history, and the study of historical sources as part of the technical analysis of materials and objects. So um, I would also like to thank my colleagues at the Rijksmuseum, um, my former colleagues at the Maritzhaus, and also Jaap Baum, um, and specifically for the research that took place on them Remembrance Martin and Opian. Uh, we had a, numerous external partners involved in that project. And uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Patria, for a fascinating presentation. Uh, I think that there were so many critical concepts in there that relate not only to this ses session, but also to the session that's coming up this afternoon in terms of you talk about that moment when it's decided that the painting is coming off the wall, that it's no longer exhibitable because of too much retouching. And I think that's a really interesting thing to debate, especially when you brought up how in the 19th century, people were, were observing what they thought was wood grain on the back of these panels and how that's been treated over the years and interpreted over the years. So um, we started out with the, Francesca's critical question is the painting hanging upside down really an eternal question in our field? And the, now we're getting on to um, that moment in the lifetime of an object where sometimes it enters the infamous study collection and what becomes of it then in terms of its use for research and education. And so with that, I'd like to welcome all of uh, the this morning's speakers up for the beginning of the panel discussion. Thank you again, Patria.